I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This week's sponsor is Book of the Month Club again. Book of the Month Club is a service which I think is like the best thing ever, where you get to pick from five books each month uh, to get whichever one is your favorite. Book of the Month Club is offering Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books listeners uh, an exclusive offer of signing up for just $5 for your first book. This is not to be missed, bookofthemonthclub.com. Go check it out. And many of the books on this podcast have been Book of the Month Club picks. Uh, so go, just go buy them. Enter code Zibby, Z-I-B-B-Y, for this exclusive offer. Today I'm interviewing Con Igledon by phone. Con is a best-selling author of historical fiction, most notably the Emperor series and Conqueror series. He also co-wrote The Dangerous Book for Boys with his brother Hal, we call Harry Igledon, and most recently The Double Dangerous Book for Boys with his sons Arthur and Cameron. A graduate of the University of London and a former English teacher and department head, Con currently lives in England with his wife and four children. So welcome Con to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks for coming on the show. It is a pleasure. So how did you come up with the idea for the dangerous book for boys and the newest double dangerous book for boys newly released? What what inspired you to write these books? I mean, the original book was back in 2006, and it was partly because I had a son. I started to look around for the sort of books I'd had in the house when I was growing up because my father was born in 1923 and his father was born in 1850. So he had my dad very late, which meant we had titles of books with things like 101 Chemical Amusements for Boys in the house. And, and they would say, go to the apothecary and get a sixth of an ounce of flour of magnesium or something like this. And you couldn't do it anymore. So I looked around, you know, for sort of modern equivalents. And when I found there weren't any, I thought, well, I'll, before I forget it all, I'll, I'll settle down with my brother six months in a shed and we'll see if we can knock it all up into a book. I mean, we didn't expect it to be popular. We didn't expect anyone to enjoy it. He said to me, do you think it'll be a bestseller? And I said, honestly, Harry, no. Um, there are loads of books published each year and it's very hard to get into the top 10 and all the rest of it. But we will get complimentary copies. I mean, this is true. We will get complimentary copies from the publisher, uh, which we can give you know, to my kids and, and your kids when you have them and you'll have these and it'll be something cool that we did together for six months. And, you know, that's it. That's it. That's what we're doing is these are just making decent memories. I mean, that was, it, it turned out to sell really well. It turned out there were a lot of people out there who cared about the same things. And that remains one of the sort of most satisfying things I think that I've done was, was discovering that, discovering that connection. I didn't really know it before. I thought it was just him and me and, you know, setting things on fire. <laughs> it's kind of fun to discover that there were so many out there who are also interested in stories of courage and, you know, making a bow and arrow and a catapult and a go-kart and conquers and all the rest of it. And that was sort of joyous. I think that goes, it goes back to this whole write what you love, right? You're, you're just doing yes. something for the pure joy of it. And then people respond to that versus if you had tried to write a bestseller. I mean, I know you have written yeah. many other bestsellers, but in your historical fiction genre, but if you had tried, maybe it wouldn't have come out so well. Well, exactly. I mean, my, my normal sort of my normal writing life is to write about Julius Caesar and Genghis Khan. I try and, you know, write exciting and interesting stories. But this was literally taking six months off because in those days I was 18 months ahead of publication. The publishers always like you to have a second book in the can before the first one comes out so that they've got a, a sort of constant role. And they know they know when to put it in the year and things like that. So I thought, well, 18 months is a long time. I can just get rid of six of those, write this other book and I'll still have a year. So it was literally trying to sort of squeeze in a personal project in between, you know, my main line. And that was the one that took off. It was a real surprise. It was a sort of joyous surprise, as I say. The second book, the Double Dangerous book for boys, that's after 12 years of having, I mean, that's that first son now is, gosh, he's 19. And my second son is 12. And between them, an awful lot of the ideas came from them. They would bring home a, a Rubik's Cube. They bring home a padlock and sort of be talking about the fact that they were trying to pick it. And my youngest son came back from a class and said, I've just, I learned how to use sign language to sign H-I so that I could say hi to people behind the teacher's back. And I thought, brilliant, that's got to go in. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, these are great ideas. So an awful lot of them were things that came from the two boys and coupled with things I sort of wished I had put in the first one, but, you know, never got around to things like casting items in resin. 
which we I've always admired, <laughs> learning how to do it was fun. I mean, you know, when we were doing it, nothing could drop dead within a mile of our house without immediately being put into resin and and set in uh, perspex forever, <laughs> because it was it was just one of those fun things. Once we discovered how to do it, it was great. We were dipping coins in there and doing uh, dome shapes and all sorts of things. I mean, this was uh, things like making perfume, for example, because everybody has that experience. And this is more common than I realized of trying to make perfume for their mother, often on Mother's Day, where they steal a lot of flower petals from gardens nearby and then boil them. Hmm. And it ends up as a sort of dirty brown water that doesn't, it neither smells nice and it does not look nice. And of course our mothers, I, I remember mine was quite a nice perfume bottle that I'd got from somewhere, but her expression, you know, had to be seen to be believed. So discovering there was a way, an actual technique to do it properly and use white lard to soak up the scent. Oh, it's, it's one or two of the things I wanted to do were always to make the, the bad things that we tried that didn't really work too well to make them better. You know, that has been a lot of fun. I bet. I gave this book, my son is 12 and he went off to boarding school this year and I gave it to him and he and the boys in his dorm have been pouring over it. <laughs> so thank you for Good. that. Yes. Because right, it's, it's, I, I never intended it to be a sort of book that you would start at the beginning and read all the way through. It's, I hope it's a book you dip into. Mm -hmm. And then my, my sort of, I've defied a few people to, to say, look, open the chapter list and see if there's any, you know, anything that catches your eye because there is always something. And then with any luck, they'll read on to something else because I've got loads of things in there, such as, I don't know, legends of ancient Greece and Rome, which are just interesting to know. It's one of my things that I, I'm always keen with my sons in particular, that they get a lot of satisfaction from knowing things and being able to to make things and do things, yes, but also to have a bit of their own sort of, not secret knowledge, that's the wrong word, but expert knowledge that makes, it gives them a sense of control in the world. I think, and I would say this is a male characteristic, it seems to be more than for women, that they, they seek to control the world by an uncontrollable world to some extent, the chaos of it, by throwing chains on it, by, by trying to understand and become experts in certain areas. And it seems to work for them. I mean, it's, it's a sort of recognizable, the, the male expert on a particular thing, whether it be ancient coins or trains or Dyson vacuum cleaners, is a thing. It, it, it's something we do. You can call it train spotters or nerds or whatever it is. But it's, it's that. I think it's that. It's trying to make the world less chaotic by understanding a part of it. Hmm, so interesting. And I, I feel like so many of the skills that you include in the book are things that might get pushed aside in favor of teaching new things today, but then you miss so much. I mean, putting in like how to tie a Windsor knot and even, so, you know, it's like some of these things are, it's almost like how to build a fire, these like elemental things that no, like, why is no one teaching our kids how to do these things? And then they grow well, up um, and, you know. Yeah. I mean, sometimes they are, of course, you know, with, uh, you know, scouts. They do a fantastic job in scouts, for example. But there is an awful lot of the business, and I'm, I'm as guilty of it as anyone else, where they, you know, you sit a kid in front of Teen Titans or SpongeBob SquarePants and leave them alone for three or four hours. And the, the trouble with that is that everything good that I remember, all the good stories from my childhood, pretty much started because the television was awful. <laughs> and so I, so I only had three, there were three channels in those days in England and there was no morning television and television stopped at about midnight and went down to a white point on the screen after the national anthem. So I am old enough to remember this. I was going to say, you're, and, really, you're really dating yourself here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am. Well, my dad grew up in an era without, before television was even invented. So, I mean, you know, I do, we do go back a long way. My grandfather, I mean, he grew up near a, a horse from the charge of the light brigade and he went to see Wild Bill Hickok's Wild West show. I mean, that, that, you wow. talk, talk about dating, that goes back a fair bit. But I guess the, the point of these things is that when we went outside, we had adventures and had memories and did things and made things and crafted things that have stayed with us for the rest of our life, even if it was being chased across a park by a man I'd angered. I mean, this sort of thing, you don't get it if you're sitting inside watching 14 episodes of Teen Titans or or getting to a new high score on Crossy Road or, or becoming a famous scream name on uh, Call of Duty. It's not good for you. It's not good for you in the same way. We're not looking to supplant the internet or, or to replace it. That's, it's too entrenched in many ways now. But I hope that these are things that will be in addition to, that people will read and do them and want to know them and want to learn them and want to learn the skills because I think it's useful. I think. And I think people are craving it. I think people are so overwhelmed by technology and the 
prevalence of it that they're just longing for, you know, quote, the good old days. And a book like this can yeah. help take you back. It gives you the, the, the tour guide. It's the tour guide, if you will. Yes, um, it's something I think we're all having to come to terms with because, I mean, I said the TV was terrible when I was a kid, but it's not terrible now. The point is there is... There's such a level of sort of, there's so many thousands of episodes. I could find any 50 episodes of, you know, decent comedies to watch right now. And that means that there's so much entertainment that I have to make a sort of conscious effort to step away from it. Whereas when I was a kid, if Ben Hur came on, it'd be four hours of television and to your absolute amazement, you'd go out for the day and come back and it would still be on. I mean, it just wasn't, it wasn't as gripping. And that meant that we did an awful lot out of sheer boredom. And that, that is a force that is almost vanishing from the world. Mm -hmm. J.K. Rowling, you know, famously looked out of a train window for a whole hour and thought about Harry Potter. And it came partly because she had nothing else to do. She's now on Twitter. If she was on Twitter back then, then we would never have got the boy wizard with the strange scar. I mean, these are things that come out of not being too stimulated by constant entertainment. And, you know, there's always something going on. To some extent, that's a problem that adults will have to deal with separately. But for children, we know it's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. We know that the more screen time leads to, well, to, you know, less happiness. I mean, it's observable. We know that generally the things when people talk about mental health and anxiety, there are some things that will help with it, but none of them are being on a phone or being on social media or watching, you know, 20 more episodes of Modern Family, <laughs> even though Modern Family is brilliant. I mean, the ones that the things that will help are getting a good night's sleep. And uh, I say this to my kids that when your problems are overwhelming, go to sleep. When you wake up, your problems will be exactly the same, but you'll be slightly better able to deal with them. And honestly, that might sound like trivial or <laughs> trite advice, but I didn't really understand that until I was about in my 30s, I think. <laughs> and it's the first thing I do when there's an overwhelming problem, I go to sleep I'm almost immediately. And uh, that's one thing we know. And we know exercise is more important than, well, I think anyone realized before when it comes to anxiety and your mental health, because I know people who have literally run from depression. They have run miles every day, even though it seems unrelated. If you feel down because of a financial problem or a relationship problem, you feel better. It's like the sleep thing. You feel better able to deal with it. And the last is those crafts and skills. There is something oddly calming about gaining confidence through becoming competent. And if you can make something like a simple elastic band gun out of scrap wood, or if you can, I don't know, set things in resin and polish it with toothpaste until the things like glass, this is, it's calming. And actually I'm reminded, I did a chapter on polishing shoes like the British Army. And that came from the fact that I met a soldier who said, one of the happiest times in his life had been sitting in a room with five or six other guys and the windows all steamed up and they were just working on their boots for a parade the following day until they were like black glass. And he said it was just that thing, just talking and sitting and working in tiny little circles on the boots. And he said, as I say, that it was one of the happiest, calmest times of his life or something he looked back on with great nostalgia. And I think, you know, that kind of thing is important. And you, you don't find that, you really don't when you're wearing a headset and screaming at someone to destroy all the others. Totally. And I feel like you obviously created this experience with your own sons by doing the book with them. And, you know, they yeah. even said, thank you. Like, no matter what happens, the best part was just the time that you all spent together experimenting yeah. and, and fine-tuning some of the tips that you included. <laughs> well, that was the nicest thing. I mean, because obviously... With the Rubik's Cube, say, my son Cameron came home with it. He was the only one who could do it. He, he claims to be able to do it in 29 seconds. No one has been able to get him below 44 in public, but <laughs> he claims to be able to. And, you know, he would come home and then we all had to do it. So he oversaw it. He wrote out the instructions. Then I did it. My wife did it. My daughters did it. My younger son did it so that we could be certain that absolutely anybody could do it who didn't know the Rubik's Cube and wasn't particularly in any, didn't have any previous knowledge. So we did this sort of thing together and as a family, whether it was playing, you know, learning, playing whist together or playing cheat or card games in general or playing daft things like the bowl of flour where you have a match standing up in it and each of you slices away a piece of the flour until the match falls over. And then you have to pick it up in your teeth, which usually ends up with flour all over the place. <laughs> and somebody, you know, choking on great clouds of it because it's fun. And we did all this thing, all these things together because... That was sort of the, the first rule of the book was that if we couldn't make it work, it didn't go in. So that was underpinning every chapter. I mean, there are some things I didn't put in because I just could not get them to function properly. Like that, we did a the blowing the lid off a, a tin 
using flour blown across a candle stub. And I, I just couldn't get it. I couldn't get it to ignite. It's kind of a famous experiment, I suppose you can call it, for want of a better word, but we could not get it to work. So therefore, I, I couldn't put it in. But the experience of working together quietly often, you know, as a family, teaching each other stuff so that my son Arthur taught us all how to do a jumping paper frock. And now I can do one and Cameron can do one. And honestly, it's oddly satisfying. It's quite difficult to put my finger on why it's satisfying, but it's, it's something I can do. It's a decent craft. I can make a good paper aeroplane. I can make a good paper frog. I can make a little paper box that is as neat as anything you'll ever see. <laughs> and all those came from working together. And that was, I think, I think it was a good thing to do. So were your daughters, did they feel a little left out? I mean, your two sons got to write this book with you. I feel like anything I do, I have four kids, two boys and two girls too. I feel like if I did something Ah. just with my sons, my daughters would kill me. Yeah, I I do. I know what you mean. But obviously, to some extent, my daughters are are 16 and 13. They knew I was doing the sequel to the original Dangerous Book for Boys. So they knew that on the whole, I was celebrating boyish things. And I mean, I did the first one with my brother and we were looking back to our childhood. And this time I was doing, you know, things with the sons. They, they do know that. At the same time, obviously, quietly, as you will know, if you have the two daughters, you can't keep them out. You know, <laughs> they, were, they were involved in an awful lot of it. I mean, we did things like the frustration games and uh, the suggestions that came from them. We did actually keep a list of all the things they were involved in at the same time. But it, it doesn't change the title of the book. I mean, the title of the book is intended for boys and by boys, but... You know, as it happened, some of the chapters were inspired by my daughters. Of course, they were. And do you have plans to do more of these? Or how how high are you going? Quintuplet? You know, funnily enough, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I, originally I said, you know, I hadn't got anything else to do. I hadn't got anything else to add in. And then 12 years went past and I, I had more material than I could sort of shake a stick at. So that's how the second one came about. And I thought, well, that's got to be it. And then in the in the month since it's been finished, We've already started to put a list together of things because there are always more stories of courage, for example. You hear of a good one. I mean, in this one, The Double Dangerous, I went to see a man called Victor Gregg talk. And he was in his 90s and he had driven about 100 miles to to get there and he was driving home afterwards. And he told a story of his time during World War II, which was so ridiculous and extraordinary it, I mean, he was in almost every key battle. It was just unheard of. His, his, by fluke and by sheer bad luck, for the most part, he was involved in some of the major actions of World War II. And as a result, I thought, well, I've got to put his story in because it is a terrific, unknown, almost, story of courage. There'll always be new material like that. I mean, my son Arthur, I've got to tell you this, my son Arthur came back from Scouts the other day, and he had something that was like a three-foot dart out of, out of wood, a big stick, basically, or dowel. And he'd sharpen the end so it was a decent sort of point. And then he'd added cardboard flights to it with sellotape. So it was really cheap. It was like the cereal packet stuff. And, uh, you know, we, we went outside and we threw it. And it didn't go as far as I expected it to. And then he showed me that they had told him in Scouts that if you wrap a piece of string around it, three or four turns, not much more, and hold the end in your hand and, and then hold the dart between, say, finger and thumb, as you let go of it, you hang on to the string so it rotates and spins through the air and it goes about twice as far. And that's, that's brilliant. I mean, <laughs> I, I said to him, why didn't you come and tell me this when I was doing the book six months ago I'd have put that in? But it means eventually, I suppose, we will have to do a triple dangerous or something like that because, you know, there, there, are, so, <laughs> there are so many good ideas out there. Well, tell me also, you are a super successful historical fiction author, right? With like series and tops of the charts How did you become so interested in writing historical fiction? I know you had been an English teacher. How did did that start? I mean, probably the interest in history does come from having the, well, partly the grandfather who was, had a link to history and my father who seemed to have lived through most of it because he was in bomber command in World War II and had dropped just about everything you can drop from a plane. So he had lots of good stories you know, like the time he was sent over with a French spy and, and had to try and get the man to parachute out, even though he had a fear of parachuting. And, you know, it, there are wonderful stories like that that gave me a connection to history. And also, I mean, my mother grew up in Ireland in the 1930s and became a nun at the age of 14. And then in a closed order, so she never expected to come home again or see her parents again. And she stayed as a nun until the age of 34. And as it happens, the Catholic Church loosened up a little bit, so she was able to come home in the full black and white wimple to see her parents. But when she eventually left the convent 
and thank goodness had children from my point of view <laughs> because she left the convent to have children. She met my dad and frankly he had no idea what hit him. I was obviously delighted by that, but it gave me a, a sort of contact with a, a past that was very, very different. I mean, you know, they used to go to church in the, on Sunday on with a pony and trap, and it was a different era. So I had a sense of history being closer, I think, than most people do. But as it happens, I mean, don't forget, I wrote a book a year from the age of 11 to about 28, and with, with no success whatsoever. <laughs> the difference, you know, they, they turned me down every time. The difference came when I was in a history classroom. I was covering someone else's lesson. I was an English teacher. And I came across a scene of Augustus Caesar throwing the heads of Julius Caesar's assassins at the foot of his statue in Rome. And I thought, what sort of an extraordinary relationship must that have been to want to do that? And there were 23 assassins and not a single one of them died a natural death. And I thought, gosh, you know, everyone knows the end of this story, but I, you know, I, I'd like to know a little more. I was very lucky. I came across a book called Caesar Christian Mayer, M-E-I-E-R, and he was, and that was brilliant. It was a great introduction. It told me about Julius Caesar being captured by pirates at the age of 18, and I thought, which he was, and has held for ransom for months, and I thought, this, there is a story here, and I, I wrote it for two years because Everyone knew the Titanic sank. Everyone knew Julius Caesar was assassinated, but not how he got to that point. His name was sort of general knowledge, but they didn't, they didn't know the full, the full beginnings, and it was the beginnings that made the end make sense. So I, I sort of set out to write that, and that went, that went really well. I, was, I think I was influenced by, um, or my readers were, by Gladiator, the film, because mm-hmm. it came out. I remember watching it in the darkness thinking, oh, God, don't let it be about Julius Caesar because you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a year in. This is going to kill me. But as it happens, it wasn't. It was brilliant. And I think it was a sort of engine for Roman fiction for a while. Although, I mean, I stayed with Julius Caesar for four books at that point, And then I went on to Genghis Khan, who was a much harder sell because everyone's heard of him. But the only thing they know is you know, he was a destroyer of cities and nations. And the fact that he was a, a great brother and father and son and grandfather, he was a wonderfully doting grandfather, was completely lost on them. And the, the story of Genghis Khan is a warm family story about family and about love. And they, with, admittedly, the destruction of cities and nations. I mean, I'm not being funny, but of course that was, that was went on. It's just that it, it would, gave me a chance to sort of approach it in a way that appealed to well, both sides of my character, I suppose, the bit that likes the, the destruction and the bit that likes the stories about people, you know. So yes, I've always, I've had a lot of access to history through my relatives, I suppose. But I, I, at the end of the day, it's all good stories. We just like good stories. We're the, the only creature on the planet that ever gathers around and listens to someone talk about history or books or people. At the end of the day, we're just interested in people, which is, that's not such a bad epitaph, really. Very true. You have written so many books. You've obviously stuck with it despite a lot of rejection. How do you do this? How do you sort of beef yourself up to say, I'm going to keep doing it and I'm not going to be discouraged by what people say. And how do you maintain that positivity? I mean, at first when I was just rejected for year after year after year, I mean, I I used to put hairs from my head in between the pages to see if the publishers were even reading them. (laughs) That's Actually, very often the the hairs would still be there. And I um, thought, aha. And then years later, I said, to an editor that I used to do this, and he said, oh, yes, lots of people do that. We always make sure the hairs go back in the same place, <laughs> which is pretty cruel, I thought. Um, but the, That's funny. the point is, I suppose, that I, I liked writing. So in many ways, it was my hobby. So even if I finished a book and I sent it off and I photocopied it 20 times and sent it to 20 publishers or 20 agents and nobody picked it up and everyone said no and sent it back with enormous enthusiasm so that it would arrive on my doorstep, thump, 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 over the next few days, even then, I didn't mind too much because it just meant I had a chance to write another one. And the only difference, I suppose, with the Julius Caesar one was that I liked it so much that I took two years over it rather than usually you know, about a year. And I, I spent enormous amounts of time on that. And I, I said to my wife at the end that I think this is, the, look, this is the best I can do. If this doesn't go, I have been doing this since I was a very small kid. And if this doesn't go, then honestly, I think that's it. I'm, going to, I'm just going to try and stop. And she said, she's always said since that she didn't believe I was capable of stopping, that I would have kept going. And I can't say for sure whether it's true or not, because that was the one that was, that was picked up. But for me, it was the best I could possibly do. At the time, I like to think I was better now. 
I mean, it's 20 years later. It'd be a shame if I hadn't learned a few things. <laughs> you know, it was, it was something I, I felt almost compelled to do. I, I like telling stories. I always have. And that's the pleasure of it is, you know, it's something I'm thankful for every day. And where do you like to write? Do you have a special place you, you go? You like to go to coffee shops or where, where do you like to write? I've, I've never managed the coffee shop laptop thing. I always, I always regret that because I like the idea of it. It always looked really cool. <laughs> but no, sadly, mine is always with the PC up in the attic tapping away. I mean, it is a fairly isolated business. But at the same time, my mind is full of pictures and exciting stories. And I'm delighted reading my own scenes back to myself. So it doesn't feel too isolated at the time. It is nice to get out of the house occasionally, I will say. (laughs) I mean, you know, it's one of the things that publishers arrange to go and speak at literary festivals and things like that. And it's always a pleasure because, you know, usually I'm just on my own. So it's very nice. But I usually work during the day, get up fairly early and work during the day until the kids come home from school. And then I irritate them, you know. (laughs) Do you have any advice to aspiring authors? Well, I actually, I would say, to, I know it sounds ridiculous. And again, uh, my, my advice always seems a little too basic to actually give to anybody. But I would say to plan, to plan your work. That one of the big differences between my, the book that was successful, my first and previous efforts, was that I wrote the previous efforts in a frenzy of creativity without much planning. So they tended to ramble a bit. It was not unheard of for me to get to the end of the book and think, oh, blast, what happened to John? <laughs> and then I realized I'd forgotten John and I would try and put John back in. And, I'd, you know, I'd add John cleared his throat. John walked quickly out of the room all the way through the book so that I, because he'd started as an important character and then I'd just forgotten him. <laughs> so that sort of thing, you know, where I actually planned the book. And I, with the Julius Caesar one, the first book, I knew the last line before I wrote the first line. And that made, I think, a huge difference. I, I had worried that it would steal the creativity away from me, that it wouldn't feel quite so wild and chaotic and wonderful. Actually, it didn't at all. It just reined it in a little so that it was, ah, so that it, it was still creative. It still felt wonderful, but it wasn't quite so rambling. And that matters. And can I just ask what you're working on now? Yeah, I'm, I'm in ancient Greece at the moment, not literally, but <laughs> although I'm not, not long back from Athens and Sparta where I was wandering around the ruins to try and get a sense of the geography and the, the scents and sounds and things like that. Yes, I'm, I'm dealing with the, it's going to be Pericles and Battle of Marathon, his father, and going into the Peloponnesian War. It's an incredibly rich sort of part of history and the Persian invasion with Xerxes and Darius and all sorts of good stuff. So as I say, history is full of good stories that you don't have to look too far, but this is a particularly rich bit. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your thoughts with me today and with the uh, listeners pleasure. of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books, the award-winning podcast. This episode has been sponsored by Book of the Month Club, bookofthemonthclub.com. Enter code Zibby to get your first book for just $5. You can follow me on Instagram at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You could always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. 